I thought I'd start 2020 by looking at some global economic forecasts, not because I believe the precise numbers, but because it provides a gist for what's going to happen in the year ahead, a central case, if you will. And then we'll look at some tail risks, which are the low probability events, which could potentially have a very large impact on your portfolio. So remember, if any of this concerns you or you want to discuss it in more detail, you can always schedule a one to one power hour with me. But now let's start to look at those economic forecasts, but also the tail risks in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's start by looking at some global economic forecasts. This is the IMF World Economic Outlook, and it was published in October of 2019. What's noticeable is that for advanced economies, there's quite a marked deceleration of growth in 2019 and in 2020. Although in emerging markets, there's a bit of a bounce back from 3.9% growth to 4.6% growth in 2020. And in fact, global growth was downgraded by the IMF for 2019 to just 3%. And that's the slowest growth since the global financial crisis. We've gone from a synchronised upswing in growth in 2017 to a synchronised downswing. And the reason given for this by the IMF is rising trade barriers, uncertainty in trade and geopolitics, strain in particular emerging market economies, and long-term trends or structural factors such as low productivity growth, and an ageing global population, particularly in advanced economies. The World Bank outlook is slightly different in terms of specific numbers, but the general trend is the same, with global growth falling to 2.6% in 2019, and only rising slightly to 2.7 in 2020 and 2.8 in 2021. And they see the same upswing in emerging markets as the IMF. So that's 4% in 2019 and 4.6% in 2020 and 2021. One of the positives for growth is benign global financing conditions. In other words, low interest rates. They say that risks are firmly on the downside because of destabilising policy developments, such as trade tensions between major economies, renewed financial turmoil, and sharper than expected slowdowns in major economies. You can certainly see the slowdown in manufacturing since the beginning of 2018, and business confidence has also been eroded. So think of that as your central case. That's what happens if nothing catastrophic goes wrong. But it's always worth thinking about the tail risks. These are lower probability outcomes, but they're worthwhile considering nonetheless because they could have a great impact in the value of your investments. So let's start with the US central bank, the Fed, and their tail risks. These are taken from the US Federal Reserve's Financial Stability Report, which was published in November 2019. And one job of the central bank is to maintain stability of the financial system. So rather than ignore the vulnerabilities, this document goes into them in great detail and tries to quantify those risks. One of the tables in the report, which is really interesting, shows the size of each of the US markets. So the US residential real estate market is about $37 trillion. And that's been growing pretty much in line with its growth since 1997. The US equity market is about $36 trillion. And in this case, it's been slowing down relative to its growth since 1997. Now, one of the problematic markets, as we'll see later, is leveraged loans, but that's only a $1 trillion market. But what really should catch your eye is that its growth is phenomenally fast. That's at 15%. Although that's in line with its long-term growth, it's well above GDP growth. So at some point, growth in the leveraged loan market is going to become unsustainable, and inevitably the market will suffer a large correction. The analysis is broken down into four sections. The first one is asset valuations, which tries to gauge how expensive a particular market is. It cites three markets which look expensive, and that's corporate debt, commercial real estate, and farmland. So if you look at the spread, which is the additional income you receive to take US corporate bond risk, those have been fairly small and falling throughout 2019, despite the fact that leverage has been increasing, and that should certainly be a cause for concern. The next section is borrowing by businesses and households. The pattern here is that businesses have become more leveraged 
whereas household leverage isn't as extreme. Business leverage is now historically high relative to gross domestic product, and the parts of the debt market which has been growing most rapidly are for the riskiest firms. But they say that household borrowing remains at a modest level relative to income. So in this graph, the darker line is non-financial business borrowing as a proportion of gross domestic product. And that's been gradually creeping up, falling every time there's a crisis, and it's now at a level which is above where it was just before the global financial crisis. Whereas household borrowing relative to GDP has fallen. But in the leveraged loan market, the top shaded bar shows you how much of the debt multiples are above six times. So those are the most leveraged companies. And you can see that's been gradually increasing since 2016. The Fed's made very sure that US banks have been strongly capitalized because they don't want to repeat what happened in 2009. Life insurance companies also haven't taken on too much leverage, but hedge fund leverage is elevated relative to the past five years. Now, if you've watched the big short, you'll know what CDOs are, but the issuance of other securitized products fell off a cliff in 2008. And now a lot of companies get their money through the door via leveraged loans. Then these are packaged up inside a collateralized loan obligation or CLO. And both the Fed and other central banks have cited leveraged loans as being problematic. One of the jobs of the Fed is to stop runs on banks. So funding risk is a big deal. So the Fed wants to ensure that banks don't have too many assets, which they can't shift in the event of a run. They've got to have enough liquid assets to be able to pay back their customers' money. The wholesale funding market, which dried up in 2008 and 2009, is used much less now than it was just before the crisis. And the Fed's done its job, which is to ensure that the ratio of high quality liquid, that's easy to sell, assets, makes up a large part of the balance sheets of banks. However, mutual funds, which in the UK we call an open-ended investment company, or OIC, are holding a great amount of high-yield debt. Those are the riskiest bonds. And that's largely as a result of yields being so low. Now that's a problem because if there's a downturn in the high-yield market, those mutual funds may not be able to sell their high-yield bonds quickly enough to meet the redemptions of their clients. And that may lead to funds being gated, as we saw for Woodford in the UK. So the holdings of US corporate bonds has reached 1.5 trillion. And that's well above where it was before the global financial crisis. And the lowest credit quality bonds, or high yield bonds, and bank loans make up a large proportion of those mutual fund assets. The Fed conducted a market outreach program where they asked several banks what they considered to be the biggest risks. And what came out top was trade frictions. And the second was global monetary policy efficacy. So the question there is whether monetary policy, in other words low interest rates and quantitative easing, will actually help the global economy. Liquidity is also a concern, so how easy is it to sell assets in the event of a downturn? And I expect one of these categories, which is Iran, will probably score more highly given recent news. And the least worrying factors were a passive investing bubble, politics and household debt. The US is worried that the European economies could have a blowback effect on the US economy via financial and economic linkages with the United States, which would mean an economic downturn in Europe could affect the US financial system. One of the mechanisms for this would be a reduction in risk appetite due to uncertainty around what's going on in Europe. And that could trigger a sell-off in assets in the United States. The European banking system could also cause a blowback to the United States via credit exposures and via international dollar funding markets. And another mechanism of transmission would be through trade channels. No Deal Brexit also figures on the risk radar for the Fed, in particular the risk of a No Deal Brexit in 2020. That could trigger market and economic disruptions, and that could spill over to global markets. Systemically important financial institutions, or SIFIs, in Europe would also be a conduit for Brexit to affect global financial systems. Given the size of the Chinese economy, distress in China could also spill over into the US and global markets by diminishing risk appetite. When that occurs, you usually get US dollar appreciation as people opt to buy the safest currency in the world. And given the size of China's trading relationships, that would also cause a decline in trade and also its huge demand for commodities, which would push down commodity prices. China's trying to deflate its credit bubble, but there's still the risk that it could pop very rapidly and cause a sharp downturn. 
even though it's been managed very well so far. There's also a huge and hardly regulated shadow banking sector in China, and that's highly interconnected with banks, and that's a vulnerability for the Chinese financial sector. Now, there are several triggers which could pop that credit bubble. It could be escalation in the trade conflict, a crash in the Chinese property market, or a high-profile corporate default. The Fed also considers what would happen if the US economy were to slow unexpectedly. The initial effect would be to reduce the profits of non-financial businesses, and given the amount of borrowing which has gone on, that could lead to financial stress and default rates picking up, so more bankruptcies. In that kind of environment, investors pull back on their risk, and by selling assets, prices would decline significantly. In particular, expensive markets such as high-yield bonds and commercial real estate. And that would affect the financial system because banks would be less willing to lend. And it could also trigger a wave of selling. Now let's look at the Bank of England's tail risks. They have this nice heat map which breaks down the data into households and companies. And it ranges from just before the global financial crisis in 2007 to the latest data. The region which comes up red for household data is China, where the debt to GDP for households is at elevated levels. In the corporate space, the United States has a very high debt to GDP, and those worries are focused in the leveraged lending space. So those are the leveraged loans which we saw earlier. And just as it is in the household space, China's flagged as red in the corporate lending space. That shadow banking sector that we were talking about in China can be quantified with this total social financing number. And you can see that China has been trying to shrink the size of total social financing very gently to avoid popping their credit bubble. But the Bank of England is also concerned that the bubble could still pop. And in particular, the Bank of England is worried about linkages to the UK financial system. And that's because a lot of UK banks have a large exposure to mainland China. Drilling into the corporate debt story, the Bank of England flags the US as having a very high corporate debt to GDP ratio, and they also flag France as reaching its historical highs on that measure. But French authorities are trying to address that problem. And again, we see that one of the worries is US leveraged loans, where credit quality is deteriorating, with over half of the leveraged loans issued in 2019 having very high debt to EBITDA ratios. So that's the amount of debt a company has relative to its earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. That's just an accounting measure of the amount of money coming through the door of companies. And when it's above six, then it's time to worry. But it's reassuring to see that Italy's corporate indebtedness continues to fall. Household and corporate credit growth isn't too bad in the euro area, but the amount of sovereign debt in some countries, in particular Italy, is still an issue. And the sovereign debt crisis that we saw in Europe in 2012 has still not truly been resolved. And there are still strong interlinkages between banks and sovereigns. So if there was a sell-off in Italian government bonds, it could severely impact Italian banks, who hold a lot of that sovereign debt. But the ECB has been very careful to make sure that the balance sheets of European banks now have more loss-absorbing capital than they did just before the financial crisis. However, the CET1 ratio has improved partly because of a financing fiddle, which is the risk weights being adjusted on their assets. So there's still some work to do on balance sheets in European banks. Now let's look at the European Central Bank's tail risks. They've certainly outdone themselves with their flowcharts, which are very impressive, and they point out that there's a very low yield environment in Europe. Given the weak growth that we're seeing in Europe, that creates a worry about debt sustainability. And in particular, there's a great amount of triple B debt, which is the lowest rating for investment grade. In other words, there's a huge amount of debt, which is just one credit rating notch away from being downgraded to junk. Banks are also less profitable. Ironically, that's largely because they can take less leverage due to regulation by the central bank. And three quarters of euro area banks have a return on equity of below 8%. That's far below what it was when they could take more leverage before the financial crisis. And in this low yield environment, there's been a reach for yield. And that means that investors have had to take greater risk, either by buying lower quality credit or taking more duration risk. And some of these high yield assets are very illiquid, which means that if there's a crisis, the asset managers may not be able to sell the assets. 
So given the weak GDP growth in the euro area, that doesn't sit well with companies increasing the leverage on their balance sheet. But because of low interest rates, house prices in many of the euro area countries are rising rapidly, but the valuations are contingent on there being very low interest rates. And as a consequence, if interest rates do increase, then this asset mispricing could cause a rapid correction. And that applies to the equity market, which has benefited from low interest rates, but also gold and other safe haven assets, such as government bonds. Negative yields have been a real problem for banks in the euro area, and that's reduced their interest margin, which is the difference between the rate at which they lend and at which they borrow. And the ECB thinks that return on equity could fall further in 2020. Although insurers have got fairly liquid assets still, investment funds have been forced to buy the illiquid, high-yielding assets, which could cause problems in the event of a market turnaround. And almost three quarters of insurance and pension funds bond holdings now yield less than 1% in the Eurozone. Finally, let's look at the IMF's tail risk. That's the International Monetary Fund. The effect of US tariffs on global markets are very marked. You can see each of the rounds of tariffs reduced world equity prices, particularly in those sectors exposed to trade and technology tensions. So every time there's a new round of tariffs, one, two, three, and four, you can see equity markets sell off to some degree. Whilst at the same time, the Fed's speeches tend to rally markets, as monetary policy applies a band-aid to the global economy. The credit markets were also affected by tariffs, but probably to a smaller extent. And volatility in the United States, as measured by the VIX index, some people call it the fear index, was also affected by the tariff announcements. So here's the round trip in Fed monetary policy. They started hiking rates in 2017. It plateaued for a while in 2019, and now they've reversed course and started cutting. And market expectations are that other central banks will follow suit in Canada, the UK, and even for central banks where rates are currently negative. And the trend has been a steady fall in yields since October 2018 in advanced economy government bonds. And negative yielding advanced economy government bonds now make up a large proportion of the total amount of bonds outstanding. But the market expectation is that that will fall over time. Although it's not such a large market, leverage lending in Europe has also grown rapidly. And at the same time, the credit quality, and which is called a covenant protection, has generally weakened. So these are called covenant light loans. And the percentage of new issuance, which is covenant light, has grown dramatically. And you can see that huge rise in non-bank lending in the United States since 2012, with a larger percentage of those loans having very high leverage and greater risk of bankruptcy. Let's finish by looking at the political risks. Markets have been largely driven by this China-US trade war. So whenever there's been a sign of progress in US-China trade deal negotiations, equity markets have rallied and bonds have sold off. And if there's a deterioration in the relationship, we saw the opposite. It looks like we're going to get a signing of the phase one trade deal on 15th of January. And although that's promising, it may open up a new front in the trade war with Europe. President Trump's decision to kill Qasem Soleimani could also have very large impacts depending on how Iran chooses to retaliate. And a war in the Middle East certainly has the prospect of destabilizing global financial markets, depending on what the form of retaliation is and how the dispute escalates. One source of dispute has been how much US tech giants pay in tax in Europe, and the US has threatened trade tariffs in retaliation for those decisions in Europe. And this has the prospect of triggering a new front in the trade war. A more long-term worry is the effect of climate change on investment. The bushfire emergency in Australia is one example of that. And it's interesting that central banks are now also starting to talk about climate change. And the economic impacts of climate are very real. So for example, here's a lady who works in a museum who simply couldn't work because even inside the museum, she was still affected by the smoke. It's hard to expect people to be productive if they can't breathe. So while this isn't an immediate threat to investment, it's certainly something to consider as a longer term risk. So the trend for 2020 seems to be one of slowing global growth. And of course, there are always tail risks. At the moment, the biggest seems to be too much borrowing in the United States in the leveraged loan market, but also too much triple B debt, which is the lowest level of investment grade, and China, 
There's always a credit bubble in China which has us worried, but never quite seems to materialise. So remember, if you want to discuss this in any more detail, you can always join us on Patreon for just $5 a month. And then you can join us on Slack and you can vote on our questions on the Sunday evening live Q&A call. And of course, you can always arrange a one-to-one -one with me and then we can discuss any topic you like in as much detail as you like. So as always, thank you for listening.